For this podcast, I thought that I'd talk a wee bit about The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Robert Louis Stevenson. It was published in 1886 and has since become a classic of both Scottish literature and Gothic horror. It is very much seen as being up there with Dracula and Frankenstein. And it very much does share similar motifs and similar ideas to novels like Frankenstein. Like this uh, scepticism or worry about science and how far it will go. And this can very much be seen with Dr Jekyll being this very upstanding member of society, this pillar of society almost. But through his scientific work and experimentation becomes this degenerative, violent and vile figure known as Mr Hyde. So it very much does play on the whole idea of monsters and the horror that it comes with science going too far. But one of the aspects of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is the influences of the story of Deacon Brodie, who was alive during the 18th century and lived a double life. During the day, he was an upstanding member of Edinburgh society, worked as a cabinet maker and would build cabinets for the upper classes of Edinburgh. And this wasn't just you know, everyday cabinet you get now. These were essentially the safes for the upper classes of Edinburgh back in the 18th century. And as he would have access to their homes, he would also have access to their keys. And while he was working on building these cabinets, which is where they would store they are their wealth and their high end items, he would take casts of their keys. And with those casts he would take, make duplicates of these keys, allowing him to have access to these people's homes when they weren't there. And during during the night, whenever these people were elsewhere, he would let himself in with his accomplices and rob the upper classes of Edinburgh. Of course, the upper classes of Edinburgh had no idea that Deacon Brody was living this double life. And would then, after the, the, the robberies, get him to return in order to fix a cabinets. So he'd be making more money out of them than he possibly could otherwise. So, you could say that he was robbing them twice. But he was finally caught back in 1788. So, nearly 100 years before Jekyll and Hyde was published. It was 98 years, to be exact. And he was executed in 1788, in December of that year itself. And you can actually still visit the Ed uh, Brody's workshop, which stood on the Royal Mile, not that far from the castle itself. The workshop is now known as Deacon Brody's Cafe, and is a regular stopping off point for tourists on the Royal Mile. And I also feel that much of the Gothic horror of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, very much the atmosphere that you find within the book would have been influenced and inspired by the gothic grandeur of Edinburgh's old town, especially with its dark gothic streets and wines. And another aspect that could have easily played into the mistrust of science that you find at, during this period could have also have been due to the body snatchers 
uh, which Edinburgh played its part in. Then we have two figures called William Burke and William Hare, who were originally Irish navvies, who settled in Edinburgh. And William Hare actually had a boarding house in the city. And at one point, one of the residents, one of the boarders in the boarding house, collapsed and died. And was found dead in his bedroom. And Burke and Hare, wanting to just get rid of the body, managed to take the cadaver to the city's university, to the medical school, and sold the cadaver to a Professor Knox. And realising they could actually make some money from selling cadavers to the medical school, as there were some severe restrictions on where medical schools could get cadavers at the time. They were very much relying on using the remains of executed criminals, which were very much in short supply. So it ended up that with Burke and Hare, they resorted to murder and were regularly uh, getting boarders in the boarding house drunk and would smother them at what, once they became unconscious. And this was generally seen as being an easy target because they would not normally go for people who would not be missed, who no one would realise what we are missing in any way. But it finally came quite, or it was if they were finally questioned, or what they were doing was brought into doubt when some of the students re- uh, recognised one of the cadavers as that of a popular prostitute who they all regularly visited and who one of the, the students had seen uh, only was it either the day before or uh, recently and knew she had been well and questioned why she was now suddenly dead. So Burke and Hare were finally uncovered in what they were doing. So Burke and Hare were finally arrested in 1828 and Hare actually turned King's evidence and essentially bore witness against William Burke. We don't know what happened to Hare as he disappeared from the historical record but we know that Burke was executed and his body handed over with maybe a hint of irony, to the medical school in Edinburgh University, where he was dissected and his body is now on display in the medical museum within the University of Edinburgh. So, with Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde, there is definitely a lot of dark influences from Edinburgh's history that played a part in the writing of Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde. But if you are actually in Edinburgh and you're wanting to find somewhere of interest to the story and not just the cafe that now fills the space of Deacon Brodie's workshop, if you go up to the High Street and you go up to Gladstone's Land, you'll come across a small lane called Lady Stairs Close. If you go down that little close you'll come across a building which used to be a house and is now a museum. It's called the Writers' Museum and it celebrates the work of Robert Burns, Sir Walter Scott and Robert Louis Stevenson. And if you go down the stairs into the Robert Louis Stevenson Gallery you'll come across a cabinet and it is believed that this cabinet is one of the cabinets that was made by Deacon Brodie. So it is very relevant that this uh, cabinet is now in the Writers' Museum in the section celebrating the work of Robert Louis 
Stevenson. Hopefully you will have enjoyed this podcast, my first ever attempt at having a podcast. Uh, hopefully you will be intrigued to hear more. I will definitely love to hear what you have to say in the comments. So definitely leave uh, comments in the comment section below. And again, if you are enjoying the channel, please click on that subscribe button. Please click on that notification bell. Leave some likes, leave some comments. It's always really appreciated. And if you'd like to support the channel further, I will post a link to the channel's coffee.com page and the channel's PayPal account in the description bar below and the pinned comment in the comment section. So hopefully you will have enjoyed this little podcast and I'll see you all in the next one. Bye-bye.